Welcome back to another episode of What's Up, Prof? Hello, Walter. Martin, this is getting very boring. <laughs> <laughs> but I see the, the news anchors, they have the same tune the whole time, so I'm Wait. just sticking with it. I'm, I'm neither an anchor nor a news. <laughs> <laughs> well, after our last episode, finally we get some time to speak about the science and, and some health. Yeah, we, we've been threatening for a long time, but we never get there. Yeah, <laughs> it seems like this is a trend that's going on. We every time want to get to something, but... <laughs> something happens and you can't get there. Yeah, but now we're there, so let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you again for bringing us together. Lord, as always, we ask that you please bless this discussion, enlighten our minds and help us to discern the right from wrong. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Martin, you've put a strange title here. It comes, of course, from a Bible verse. Surely our fathers have inherited lies. Mm. Uh, you know, the devil is the father of lies, right? Yes. He was a liar from the beginning, and mm. the truth is not in him. And uh, so much of what we experience in life is based on lies. Unfortunately, just, that's true. Yes, unfortunately it is. Jeremiah 16, verse 19. O Lord, my strength and my fortress and my refuge in the day of affliction. The Gentiles shall come unto thee from the ends of the earth and shall say, Surely our fathers have inherited lies, vanity, and things wherein there is no profit. But that's an amazing verse. So unbelievers will, in the end, come to believers and say, we've been running on lies. Mm. Hmm? Correct. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, if you just think about the issues. Now, I love science. And uh, I was a science fanatic. Mm. You know, when when kids read comics and stuff like this, I would read science books. I used to take them out of the library. I think I've said that before. I used to drive my poor mother up the wall. Mm. My room was a total disaster with attempts at building telescopes to look at the stars. Can I? It wasn't a disaster. It was just a science experiment. It was a science experiment. <laughs> I would have insect colonies... In my house, I would have cans full of different critters and worms and uh, optics and chemicals and bomb constructions. <laughs> and it was a disaster. And my mother died when I was 12. So I don't know, even know how old I was then, maybe seven or eight, just being able to read. So I've always been interested in science. And when I went to the university and I studied science, this was my fascination. Mm. Now, people always like, when I talk about issues, always say, oh, he's a zoologist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that. <laughs> when I talk about theology, oh, he's, a theologi he's, he's, a, a he's a zoologist. What does a zoologist <laughs> know about that? Yes, I studied zoology, but I was actually studying comparative physiology, mm -hmm. which is a branch of zoology. And comparative physiology means that you are comparing the physiology of every creature on the planet. Mm -hmm. right? Including humans. Including humans. Mm. So in many a, a medical faculty, uh, comparative animal physiologists fit in perfectly. Because number one, they have studied animal physiology. They have studied human physiology. Their experimentation takes place in the animal realm mm -hmm. because the general trend is that you don't use humans as guinea pigs unless, of course, you're living in our time mm. when it seems to be the norm now to use humans as guinea pigs. Yeah. Uh, in the past, you know, humans could volunteer for certain experiments, mm. but then they had to sign certain forms that they were willing 
to do this. Now you become a guinea pig door to door. I know it's very interesting how the world has changed. Yeah, yeah. But in any case, my research was done on animals. And uh, when you study human physiology, then the animal model is the one that is customarily used in science. Mm -hmm. So you either use a rat, you use a rabbit, and people will say they're not exactly the same. So then you work with vervet monkeys, and you try and get as close to the human model as mm -hmm. possible. And this is the research that I was involved in all of my life. And uh, for the last years of my university career, I was in a medical faculty. So a professor of medical bioscience. Mm. So these people who would like to use the label zoologist in a derogatory fashion or a degrading fashion. Yeah. And it, most of the time, the people that use the derog it derogatory don't even know what it means. No. They haven't got the foggiest idea of what it means. Because, you know, if you say someone is a zoologist, if you are somehow in the know, then you would ask, well, what is your field of speciality? Yeah. Are you an ecologist? Are you an en environmentalist? Are you uh, an anatomist? Are you a, whatever, a physiologist? Are you a taxonomist? It depends what your specialization is. Yeah. So there, there are so many aspects to science and so many labels. And it becomes so specialized that sometimes you concentrate your entire career on one tiny minuscule aspect. Mm. And it somehow has to fit into the big picture. So if you want to be a comparative physiologist, you have to study the insect. Mm. If you go too deeply into that, well, then you are no longer in that particular field, but you go into the field of entomology. Yeah. And that again has a lot of subcategories. So science is a, is a very broad, broad name. And a scientist is an interesting phenomenon. Mm. Because when it comes to the field of science, they use the regal we. Mm -hmm. The regal we. In other words, we discovered. It's never I discovered. Science, we know. Mm -hmm. Who's the we? We is plural, right? Correct. So we know that, whatever it is. So, whatever. Let's say we know that AIDS is derived from a virus, mm. the HIV virus. We know. Who's the we? All scientists. All scientists. So there's somewhere is somewhere something that fits into this category of we. Mm. And we is such a big word that immediately it lends support to whatever you are saying. If you say, I say, mm -hmm. then it's an individual. Yes. But when you come up against that big word, we, mm -hmm. then it becomes very, very important, right? Now, what if the we is wrong? Yes. Then, <laughs> is it you that's wrong, or is it the whole we that's wrong? <laughs> the whole we. The whole we, all right. So you come to the university, and you study evolutionary biology. It's part of the subject of zoology. Now, uh, Dr. Fauci is constantly referring to his evolutionary biologists and uh, the anti-conspiracy theorists won't call them zoologists. Mm -hmm. no. But in fact, uh, that's exactly what they should be because zoology is the mother of the evolutionary theory, right? Correct. Not botany. No. Because you can't prove it from botany, so you have to use zoology. Yes. So you have another category, evolutionary scientists. Mm. And these are very prominent in the medical sphere in the world today. And they're part of the we. Now when you study this theory of evolution, and then later you come to study this book, 
there's a conflict of interests, right? Yeah. A serious conflict of interests. And so science that wants to marry religion and science mm -hmm. will say, uh, we can compromise on this issue. We can have theistic evolution. Yeah. You cannot have that. You cannot have theistic evolution. Because you cannot have a system of death providing the impetus for the next generation in the survival of the fittest scenario mm. to come up with the final product, which is humanity. Yeah. When the scripture clearly says that death is a consequence of sin exactly. and not a means of progression to something greater. So never ever would you be able to have the plan of salvation mm. of a God becoming man and dying to give you eternal life which is nonsensical because death was there from the beginning. Whereas according to the scripture, death is an interposition, yeah. something that came in afterwards. So the two philosophies don't mix. And if you want to mix them, well, then you're a very confused scientist. Correct. And there are many of those, many theistic evolutionists. Mm. Uh, they have the plant world living without the sun, for billions of years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's totally ludicrous. And unfortunately, it's entered religion. Correct. And they have a world where you have a reducing atmosphere, no oxygen, mm. but you have to have water in order to develop the molecules of life. Now, if you don't have uh, oxygen in the atmosphere, then you don't have an ozone layer. If you don't have an ozone layer, you have radiation. If you have radiation, then you produce oxygen by splitting water into oxygen and hydrogen. So you cannot have an atmosphere without oxygen if you have water. These people are very confused, right? <laughs> and when you start realizing that, then you come to the point where science clashes with itself. And when you switch your philosophy of science, does that mean you have eradicated science? No. No, of course not. But you have come into a position of clash mm -hmm. of minds mm -hmm. when it comes to the philosophy of science. All right? Yes. Now, this is something we need to talk about because the philosophy mm -hmm. of science mm -hmm. is not necessarily the science. Correct. And we talk about the theory of evolution mm. or we talk about whatever, the molecular theories. We talk about theory, 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 theory yeah. or cellular theory. Relativity theory. What the cell looks mm. like. Okay, and every few years it changes yeah. because knowledge increases, right? And theories have to be modified. A theory is not a fact. No. When you listen to some scientists, especially the evolutionary scientists, then evolution is a fact. Mm. So they start off with an axiom that evolution is a fact. Yeah. But what if it's a fable? Then your whole theory it, it, is incorrect, mm. right? Now, when you talk about viruses in the time that we are living in, then does evolution play a part? Yes. Absolutely, because <laughs> all the variants are as a result of evolution, right? Yeah. When you unpack that at the genetic level, you will find that a lot of what we know is based on pure conjecture. Correct. And not based on truth. But it has to be hidden in the package of the we know. Correct. And is sold to humanity as a fact. As a fact, yeah. Right. Has anybody ever really produced the virus of any kind and said, here it is? No. Is there such a publication? No. Much of it is based on computer modeling. Mm. Right. And it is still in the realm of theory. Correct. No matter how plausible. 
And future knowledge could change things, right? Mm -hmm. So in the past, many, many infectious diseases were treated in the most drastic fashions. Mm -hmm. And people were deprived of their children because they had infectious diseases when in fact they had a nutritional malady. Yeah. Scurvy. If you arrived here with bleeding gums and teeth falling out, I would think you have a terrible disease. I certainly, if I was a lady, would not like to give you a kiss. Mm -hmm. I might catch it, whatever you had, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it's just a vitamin C deficiency. And then you had rickets. And all of these diseases, they were nutritional diseases, but they were all classified as infectious diseases at one stage. Yeah. So knowledge is an amazing thing. Science is an amazing thing. I mean, we can carry on forever talking in this line without getting to one single slide. Mm. And we don't want to do that. Yeah. But the point is this. Science is a passion, mm. but science isn't necessarily based on truth. You could have inherited lies. Yeah. And I want to go so far as to say that every first grader who goes to school inherits lies mm. from the very first day that he sits on a school desk. Yes. He is fed evolution. He is fed science of whatever nature. Cosmology, for example. Do we really know whether we derived from a Big Bang or not, just because some Jesuit says that we d are from a Big Bang? Mm. Is that necessarily truth? And that's the only one that they get these days. They don't get the alternative. Correct. Now, what about all the other sciences? Now, Martin, I was involved in the science of nutrition. That was my field mm. to, to our critics who would say zoologist. Yeah. I was studying uh, nutritional physiology. And I was reasonably successful in what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But it was contrary to everything that the world stands for. Yes, you were... It was diametrically opposed. Mm. And it was almost impossible to get funding for my research. Correct. No matter what my academic status was. Mm. Until I plotted and plotted and plotted. Until I finally got it recognized as a legitimate field of research. Mm. It was a war. Literally a war with even sabotage attempts against the research that was being done. Yeah. It was amazing. But it was eventually recognized. And uh, I was a recipient of a grant from the Royal Society London, which is very, very prestigious. Mm. Uh, which again brought with it, of course, many other pitfalls and enemies. Because why should someone with such strange research be even granted such a privilege? And uh, it comes with a couple of perks. You meet uh, some very high people. You meet the lords, <laughs> <laughs> for example, and have um, luncheons with them. <laughs> so it, it has uh, the upside, but it has the downside too because of the funding that is channeled into your research projects, uh, you have to work like a dog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the only reward that you have is your scientific recognition. Mm -hmm. There is not a monetary award <laughs> reward associated with it. It comes with a lot of hard work. Yeah. And... If you're controversial in your science, such as I was, you have problems. Because the world sees nutrition, human nutrition, from an evolutionary standpoint. Correct. Correct? 
So in other words, we evolved our intelligence. Yes. Does and that sound academic? We evolved our intelligence because we became predators. Yeah. And we're not very fast on our legs. And so we have to develop means in order to outwit the animals out there mm -hmm. in order to put them on our plate and consume them. Yes. Right? So a carnivore tends to be more intelligent than a herbivore, mm -hmm. so they say. So they say. Have you ever studied the intelligence of birds? incredible mm. what they're capable of and, and, and they eat plants seeds right some Sorry. of them of course eat insects eat. and mm. other things and the, and the birds of prey but uh, <clears throat> it is a notion that you're going to be more intelligent because you have to outwit somebody mm. right and uh, that is how the human species evolved to whatever status it has arrived this super intelligent mm. being. And on that basis, they work nutrition. Correct. If you take the Bible, it tells you the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. So which one is right? Right? Definitely the Bible. Science says you must base your lifestyle on animal products. Mm. So you have the basic four diet, which consists of your dairy, your meat, your plant-based, things, your fruits, your nuts and seeds and what have you. And now today we know that that is totally incorrect, right? Well, it's still a war. It's still a war, but there have been other scientists like mm. Dr. Campbell yes. in the China study and uh, huge studies on vegetarianism, etc., which prove the point. Mm. So that even the World Health Organization has to acknowledge it, whether they like it or not, right? Okay. So it was a war, and we'll talk about that war a little bit later. Why was there a war? Because the mindset of mm. the science, the we, the we. Mm. did not fit with the I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right? And uh, if you want to be a recognized scientist, you better be part of the we. That's it. Otherwise, you're going to be on your own. You're going to be on your you're own. You're going to be okay. an I. <laughs> So this statement is very true. I think many a, a Gentile unbeliever will come in the end and say, I think we've inherited lies. Yes. Can you please enlighten us, mm. those that have studied God's word, and tell us how must I survive the diseases that I am confronted with every single day of my life? And the medical world cannot help me anymore. Right. I'm in big, big trouble. Help me. Mm -hmm. And Definitely. I think we're on that precipice right now. You think so? Yeah. Okay. Do you think about the philosophy? I, I, I didn't come from, from the lower creatures. I didn't crawl out of the slime. You mean I was created in the image of God? Mm -hmm. Unless God is slime, right? Correct. I had a royal origin. A royal origin. Can you please correct the lies on this issue? So what's on my plate? Can you correct that so that I can get rid of these ailments and diseases that I'm suffering from? Is that going to happen, Martin? Yes. What about the philosophies that are out there concerning the billions of years mm. and uh, all of these issues? So we have inherited lies. So, Martin, tell us about a very prominent scientist for the times that we are living in, a Nobel Prize winner. And... Uh, we have a couple of things we want to talk about, and we will see what this man had to say. Yeah, it was interesting to when I've we always get some information from our viewers or so, and they sent me one of Kerry Mullis. He was the inventor of the PCR test. I'm yes. sure that almost everybody on the planet knows what that is today because that's what's being used to test if you are positive or negative for coronavirus. Correct. So he's the inventor of that, and that's what he received the Nobel Prize for. Yes. But he's deceased now. He's he deceased. Died in 2019 of a 
respiratory d- disease. Yes. And there was an interview that he had with Gary Knoll, that also mm-hmm. has a PhD. Yes. And I took some interesting snips out of that that we can discuss. So we will discuss what, what he found. Now, he is an interesting fellow because he also was a square peg in a round hole, right? He didn't quite fit in. No. And so the establishment didn't like him Mm -hmm. in the end. And so he didn't receive the best of press, and they tried to trash his science. Yeah. Now, I can sympathize with that, because uh, having been in that same boat, uh, I can concur with many things that he says. So let's look at a couple of things, and then we'll talk about it. Yeah, I just want to put it there. It's the same that you said earlier. When you're not forming part of the we, you, then you're, like you said, a square in a round. Now, it's interesting that most of the great inventors of truth, mm. not philosophy, mostly didn't fit into the we. Correct. Do you believe that we have made science our final arbiter on what is right? And as a result, we continue to look at science, and scientists hold themselves up to make the decision that this is right behavior, that's wrong behavior. You can do this, you can't do that. It's a good question, and, it's, and I think the answer is definitely that science, in a way, having led to this sort of decline of, the, of, the, of let's say, the Protestant church. I mean, we, we, the, the Protestants got a little bit too involved in history, and left themselves open there for scientists to come in and say to debunk Christianity because it became a mythological kind of thing rather than a, than a only by faith kind of thing and you know it became a it's not a real religion in the sense of, a, of like Buddhism or something. Science having been involved in that people said well we're not going to go to church anymore. It left a big hole in a lot of people's psychological makeup that has I think been filled to some degree by the ecological madness that people have got jumped into. And there, the scientists are, like you say, they are, they are considered the final arbiters of what's good for the planet or what's bad for the planet. And, and they hadn't got the slightest idea. Instead of have wearing white robes, they wear white lab coats, you know? Instead of like come bringing you the word of God, they bring you the word of the, the EPA or whatever. And, and, and they don't have to understand what it is that they are making you do, in fact. And people, you know, just, I think they fall naturally into it because there, there is a need in, in humanity for something like a religion. Or just like in the 17th century, they decided to stop talking about God in science. It was too complicated. It started a war. You know, I mean, we start to get Catholicism gets confused with science. You have trouble. And I think here we've got a similar kind of problem. We've got a, a religious phenomenon almost. A, a large segment of the population that has very strong opinions about something and beliefs, right? I mean, that's a religious kind of a thing, and it's tangled up with science. It needs to be untangled. The way to untangle it is to use the analytic kind of method that we used before. Pick them apart. Don't talk about this overall disease called AIDS. Well, Martin, that's a very interesting opening <laughs> discussion there. So we're pitting two entities against each other. The one is religion and the other one is science. Mm -hmm. According to him, science seems to have won that battle and pushed Protestantism and religion into the realms of mythology. And people are without an anchor, drifting on a sea. Now, we have a statement in the spirit of prophecy that says that science, rightly understood, Mm -hmm. will not be in disharmony with the Word of God. Definitely. All right? And this was my great problem when I started realizing that the Word of God was based on truth. I didn't start with Genesis. I would have ridiculed it into the middle of next week. Mm -hmm. Prophecy took the carpet out from underneath me. Prophecy. Yeah. Prophecy convinced me that God was speaking. 
And if God was speaking, then why was he lying about the beginning? Correct. Right? He first had to get trust. Correct. So I started with prophecy and ended up with Genesis. Now Genesis was a major catastrophe to me. I can imagine. Because it uh, totally destroyed my credibility at the university. With most. Do you know that I had some secret discussions with many a scientist in my office? Many a scientist in my office. Secret, so that nobody should know. I had one dean, a dean of science, come to me and say, what you are saying is the truth. And I know that you are right but I will never support you publicly. <laughs> and he didn't. Yeah. He sat in one of my lectures and he was one of the adjudicators, mm. almost like a debate. And they asked him what he thought about what I said. And he lambasted it and said, you know, Nonsense. Total nonsense. <laughs> but secretly in my office, secretly he would admit to something else. And you know, this, this really stunned me to yeah. see how deep-rooted the religion of science exactly. goes. It is so deep that it will uproot the word of God even in the Christian. It's a sad state of affairs. It is. And as he says, we have switched the robe of the priest for the white coat of the laboratory. Yeah. And very often that white coat is hiding behind a we mm -hmm. that he doesn't know about. Now we have two we's here. We have the we of the Bible. Yeah. Let us make. Yes. We will. Mm -hmm. Right? That's God speaking. And we have science that says we know yeah. when you know nothing. Exactly. Because the more you know, the more you learn, the more you know that you know nothing. Yeah. Because science is so deep that whenever you open one page, there's another page. If you dig down to that level, there's another level. Correct. And it's like the microscopic world. It has to be, because who's the, who's the main scientist? Correct. No matter, no matter what you look at, if you look at the micro world, and you go down, 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 and eventually you come to the electron microscope, they still haven't seen a virus. No. It's still a computer model, right? Correct. And so you go to the macro world, and you go up, and it goes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and endless there is no limit no there is no limit and you will never reach it no because no matter how big your telescope there's always something beyond its reach right because the creator of it <laughs> is bigger than is that bigger. and so he's absolutely right we've changed one religion for another and that religion is going to rule the world, especially in the days that we are living in. Oh. The scientists are saying so, the politicians are saying so, and the churches are saying so. Correct. Listen to the science. That is the phrase that you hear the whole time. We have to listen to the science. Correct. In our previous WhatsApp, we even showed that even in the movies, they say that science will be the savior. All right. Now, again, I want to reiterate, I too am a scientist. Yeah irrespective of what the critics want to say. And I am a lover of science. Mm -hmm. But there is an aspect of science which is based on nothing less than lies, or at the best, conjecture. Mm -hmm. Shall we continue? Yes. State agencies have taken kids away from parents when the parent, based upon informed knowledge, chose not to give their child either AZT or other chemotherapy agents, either for AIDS or cancer. And these were parents 
who knew more than the average parent and based upon their knowledge made an informed choice and those parents were deemed unfit and abusive parents and their kids were taken put into a foster home. I, you know what, in the, in the 19th, early 20th century, actually or late 19th century, in the South, pellagra was thought to be a, an infectious disease. It was a lack of niacin because Southerners were eating corn instead of wheat. The poor farmers were, and they were taking kids out of houses, homes there, thinking it was an infectious disease because everybody in the family was getting it. Put the kids in an orphanage. In the orphanage, the kid would get a little bit of niacin because they'd have some wheat. And he wouldn't get pellagra, so it made real sense. It took some guy, you know, it took him a government uh, research station in South Carolina finally got a, a somebody, some Goldberg, clever, was it? Goldberg, Goldberg. Some, some Jewish guy came down there with a little brains and said, wait a minute, this is not an infectious disease. You know, it's, it's, somebody had to, they had to throw out all the idiots that were running that, but that was a long, it was a long time and they did the yeah. same thing. They took kids out of homes. All they needed to do was bring in a little bread a little, little whole wheat bread. And Does it bother you at all? Every time we need a decision made, we're always looking for some scientist to tell us what to do, whether it's on cancer or almost any issue, where science, well, I don't. science becomes, has become a state religion. I, I, it, does, it bothers me when, when I see like um, people, uh, you know, my mother's a good example of doing that, sort of just, you know, the, her doctors are never questioned at all even though her son is, a, is sort of a medical person himself and sometimes disagrees with him. Because I'm her son, of course, I don't have any brains. There are people dying just because of AZT. I mean, that's, that's proven in big studies, big studies like the Concord study. The conclusion of the Concord study was, this stuff is not good for you, you know? The little skeleton on the little crossbars, the crossbones, the, you know, the skeleton and crossbones on, on, on the bottle says, probably wouldn't be a good idea to take this stuff unless you've got a good reason to. Now, there, I would say that probably, if you, you know, there have been, I don't know how many of the people who have died, so-called of AIDS, have actually died of AZT. Because it certainly would wreck your immune system to take that stuff for a few years. It's like, if you started taking any other chemotherapeutic agent for the rest of your life, it would be that agent probably that killed you. You know, when you give chemotherapy to somebody with cancer, you give them a round of it for maybe 14 days or a few days, hopefully you're not going to kill the patient, you're going to kill the cancer, the patient's going to survive. But you don't keep giving it to him until he dies, because he certainly will. And AZT is just like those things, it's a little more lethal. Have we photographed AIDS? Do we have AIDS in a test tube? Because if we haven't proven HIV causes AIDS, then can we show that what we're calling HIV is an actual organism? Nobody has actually purified HIV. There's no little bottle of HIV anywhere on the planet that's just got HIV in it. They have cell lines that they think that it's growing in. There are a lot of people that think it's not even there at all. But I mean, I, I wouldn't doubt that it's there. I, I think anything you can imagine is there somewhere. You know, but whether it's there or not is not the question. The question is, does it do anything with regard to these set of diseases that we've now called AIDS? All right, there's another little snippet, Martin. So some infectious diseases were actually just shortages of a vitamin, right? Yes. We mm -hmm. spoke earlier of scurvy, vitamin C. Now he spoke about niacin deficiency in bread. And children were removed out of houses. And very soon there will be legislation that if you do not receive a certain injection, then you are not fit to be amongst society. Mm -hmm. Now that is part of history. Yeah. They have done it all along. And there have been many, many tears. And eventually they came to the conclusion that they were wrong. So what makes it so certain, Martin, that the present generation is the one that's right? Correct. Or will a future generation find out that they were possibly wrong? Well, if you take history, the record is not very good. No, the record is not very good. But you see, there are many successes. And if you see science portrayed, you always see these white coats and these fancy labs and these dispensers. And uh, they're very accurate, some of them. You know, they work in microliters and even less than that. 
and you have very fancy machines, and they're beautiful machines, chromatography machines, amino acid analysis. I had all of these machines. They cost millions mm. in my laboratories. My students were very acquainted with them. I worked with electron microscopes all the time. A university normally has one. It's normally located in one department, like the physics department, and all the other departments use it. Mm. And so there are many things that you can say, all right, this is what it looks like. But when it comes to the level that he's talking about, like AIDS, for example, there's no bottle which says, here it is. Correct. It doesn't exist. So it's purely based on conjecture. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of logic behind it. Something is causing the disease. Mm -hmm. Something is causing the disease. And the prescribed treatment for the disease can certainly kill you, yeah, as he said. So uh, if we don't have it in a bottle and we don't know that it exists other than it is probable that it exists because something is making you sick, mm -hmm. whereas in the previous cases that we discussed, it wasn't something that was making you sick, it was the absence of something Correct. that was making you sick. Yes. Right? Mm-hmm. So he's, he's on the same page here. And the cure that is prescribed is deadly. Yes. It's got a little skull and crossbones on it. It's something that you don't want to put in your body. Mm. And it might prevent the immediate impact of whatever is happening. But sooner or later, it gets you. Yeah, because it's treating the symptoms and not the cause. Correct. So what if the cause is something else and we don't really know? We have a theory. Is it a fact? No. No. This is the point. But everyone you talk to talks as if it is a fact. Yes. We know. Mm -hmm. We don't know. Here's the Nobel Prize winner saying we don't know. Do the scientists like him? No. No. Do we see the same thing happening in our day today? Well, let me put it to you this way. Time will tell. Mm. Time will tell. Time discovered scurvy's problem. Yeah. Pellegro's problem. You name it. Polio's problem. If you look at the polio issue and the surge of polio in the world, it fi I find it fascinating, Martin, that the polio increases in Africa, for example, mm -hmm. are very closely correlated with the increases of the use of DDT. Yes. And when DDT was banned, it came down. Mm -hmm. And the decline is, is associated with vaccine. Mm. But is it possible that the decline might be associated with something else? It's possible. So if we take many of the diseases in the world and you compare vaccinated countries with unvaccinated countries, for yeah. example, mm -hmm. the vaccine was introduced at a time when the problem was no longer there. Correct. Because the decline not only took place before the vaccines were introduced in countries that were vaccinated, but also in areas that were not vaccinated. So what had changed? Why did, why did the numbers come down before the vaccination? And the vaccination gets the credit when in actual fact it was better nutrition that should get the, the credit yeah. in many cases. Mm -hmm. Now, what increased the nutritional value? The development of the transport system. Correct. Martin, the first train to roll along the rail lines in the United States of America came in 1844. Yeah. So if you wanted to get produce mm -hmm. from Mexico to the north of Canada, you'd have to get onto your horse and buggy yeah. and go and fetch it. Correct. <laughs> it will never get there in time. Correct. <laughs> So when the transport systems opened up, the markets opened up. Mm. That meant variety of food was available that was never available before. Mm. That meant disease declined in areas dramatically 
Then someone discovered the vaccine, introduced it when the problem was already solved. Yeah. Now, people don't like that information. And some of the graphs are literally changed. Mm. But the fact of the matter is that most vaccines were introduced after the problem had already been eradicated. Yeah. Shall we continue with this discussion? Yes. What, what is it about humanity that, that, that it wants to go to all the details and stuff and listen, you know, these guys like Fauci get up there and start talking, you know, he doesn't know anything really about anything. And I'd say that to his face, nothing. The man thinks you can take a blood sample and stick it in an electron microscope and if it's got a virus in there, you'll know it. He doesn't understand electron microscopy and he doesn't understand medicine. And he, doesn't, he should not be in a position like he's in. Most of those guys up there on the top are just total administrative people and they don't know anything about what's going on at the bottom. But you're talking about 100,000 scientists who are making $6 billion this year, more than on cancer and heart disease combined. Mm -hmm. You'll have probably five to 15,000 studies written and published over the next year and a half to two years on this phenomenon. Everyone wants to be a part of that action. Why is it there's only a small handful of scientists like yourself and, and um, uh, Gilbert and Duisberg who are willing to challenge this? What well, makes you different okay, than 100,000 uh, One thing people? that makes me different is I don't have to answer to anybody for money. See, I don't work for some organization like that Tony Fauci happens to be the head of. Like a lot of people like Duisberg had the intellectual... Uh, integrity, knowing that he was going to catch it, knowing that they were going to just have a heyday pulling his grants, he went ahead and said it, and he got, he's basically, he's been martyred. You know, I, I think that money is the main, the only, you know, it's just like in political scandals, follow the money trail, figure out who's getting paid for this, who's getting the money for those Western blots. They've got a personal kind of agenda. They make up their own rules as they go, they change them when they want to, and they smugly, like Tony Fauci, does not mind going on television in front of the people that pay his salary and lie directly into the camera. Martin, that is a very controversial statement that the man has made. Mm -hmm. And uh, he no longer is with us, so we can't ask him to give us more reasons as to why he says something like that. But basically what he is saying, just because you have a position in the CDC or in the World Health Organization or wherever, does that make you the be-all and the authority of everything? No. Hmm? No. And also, like he said, that one guy that was basically martyred, it brings back to mind what you mentioned earlier of that dean. Yes. He was not prepared to be martyred. No, he wasn't prepared. For the, for but the some, truth. some are willing to stick their neck out and stand for the truth, even if you're going to be ridiculed, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I remember my first day when I sat in my office and I thought of Peter, who had denied his Lord three times. Mm. And I had to go and do the evolution discussion group with all the postgrad students and the entire staff present. And I was this former atheist, fanatical evolutionist. Mm. And was I going to deny him and keep my career and my status? Or was I going to ask some piercing questions. Well, I heard that cock crow and I thought, am I going to be a hypocrite all my life for the sake of my career? And I decided I won't. And the rest is history. I've been spat on in my face in front of hundreds of students. Lecturer gets up, comes to the front, spits in my face in front of them all. Mm. I've been sworn at, I've been ridiculed, I've been shouted at, I've had it all. 
I remember the one case where the lecturer went into such a fit of rage. It was indescribable. He had a pile of books in his hand. He threw them on the ground, swore like a trooper, and ran out of the hall because the alternative was he had to come and beat me up, right? No. There was deathly silence, and the students looked at me, and I said, if you pick up a stone and you throw it in a dark alley and a dog yelps, it means you've hit him. <laughs> <laughs> It was pandemonium. But I can see what the man is saying. Mm -hmm. You have these high-placed individuals who will, who will uh, follow the money trail. And if you look at some of them, I'm not saying that he's definitely wrong on everything because he's involved in the money trail and he's yeah. involved in the patents and the research and all of that. But that what he says, is it necessarily true? Yeah. Well, I, there were quite a few things that in a short period of time had to be reversed. Okay, so he's, he's the master of reversal also, right? <laughs> <laughs> and are there scientists that vehemently disagree with him? Yes. But his position is such that he has the clout mm -hmm. behind him. The we. He has the we. We have decided. And who are the we? Mm. And why is it that the we write articles in the journal Lancet, which they have to later retract because they're basically lies? Crazy. Isn't that correct? Isn't mm. that what happened? Yes. Doesn't that make you think? Shouldn't you start wondering what's going on in the yeah. world? Is science really the new religion on the planet? And what one man says in a position of authority, when he shoves his little hand into his pocket yeah. and says that he loves the Jesuits, yeah, is that going to make him right? Maybe people must uh, open their eyes a little bit more. Maybe they must open their eyes. Let's have a look at another one. Let's see what he has to say. He's a very interesting man. <laughs> yeah. When I sent PCR, <laughs> no thanks. They rejected it. Nature rejected the PCR paper that I wrote, and so did Science, both of those austere magazines. But they took, Nature took the cosmological significance of time reversal, which was the uh, sort of lunacy of a, of, a, of a sophomore, I mean a second year graduate student in biochemistry. That, that, when that happened, it really, that was my first real shock about science. I said, there's nobody minding the store. You know, there aren't any wise old men up there. How could this happen? How could they let me publish this theory in Nature? It's not like in some backwater journal. Nature. You know, a lot of the professors in the department said, what in the hell is this? One of our graduate students just put his own paper in Nature, and it's not even about biochemistry? The thing that I learned, like, back in 1968 when I first published a paper by myself in Nature in a field that I had no expertise in at all. Uh, there are no old wise men up there at the top of science, where, which I would have, I really did until 68, I would have thought, you know, if you try to publish a dumb paper in a journal like Nature, it won't get published. But if you try to publish a good paper in there, like I later tried to pub publish PCR, the invention of PCR in the same journal, and uh, they didn't take it. It's up there. There isn't an up there there. There's no place up on the... There's, the Academy of Science is just a bunch of idiots, just like everybody else. You know, the editors of journals, austere journals even. They're just busy with their little lives and stuff. There are no old wise men up on the top making sure that we don't do something really dumb. An apple is an apple. You know, you can get something that's kind of like... If you've got enough things that look kind of like an apple and you stick them all together, you might think of it as an apple. But and, the, and HIV is like that. Those tests are all based on things that are invisible, and they are the results are inferred in a sense. PCR is separate from that. It's just a process that's used to make a whole lot of something out of something. That's what also, it is. Um, but, it's, but it's not. It doesn't tell you that you're sick, and it doesn't tell you that the thing you ended up with really was going to hurt you or anything like that. That's why it's not. 
So even if you believe in HIV, it can't tell the difference between virus particles or active live virus. I mean, there's a lot of questions involved. Well, Martin, that gives you a little bit more insight. Now, the very prestigious journals out there are the journal Science in the United States of America. Maybe Scientific American is a little bit more popular. It's not quite on that level. And in the UK, it would be the journal Nature. And every scientist's dream is to get a paper published in the journal Nature. And here this man, who later won the Nobel Prize because of his invention, couldn't get his paper published in the journal Nature, but he wrote a silly little thing when he was a student on cosmology, which was total nonsense according to him, yeah. and they published it. Hmm. So, you know, where are the criteria? He says, there, it's just like everything else. It, uh, it depends on your, on your situation and on the status and on whatever is being said. Mm -hmm. uh, that yes, is what's being, the norm being told? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, when we did our research at my university, one of my students, mm -hmm. a very, very bright student, he became a, a postdoc fellow at Harvard University. You, you don't achieve that easily. And uh, he was involved in this, this very controversial research that we were doing on dairy, for example. Mm. You don't get to be a postdoc out of a foreign country like South Africa at Harvard for nothing, right? Yeah. And he got there. Now, he was my student. And uh, this was my research. And he was the one that was taking it to a PhD level, right? And uh, some of the results were so stunning that I said to him, we've got to publish this in Nature. <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Let, let's write it up and send it to Nature. Well, they didn't take it. Yeah. No. So, and I don't feel so bad now that the Nobel Prize winner tells me that they refused his paper as well. Yeah. But we got it published in the Journal of uh, Primatology. So it got published but it didn't get published in Nature. But uh, I can understand exactly where he's coming from and how he thinks. If you don't have a particular mindset, how are you going to get an article into the Journal of Paleontology, for example? Mm. Now, I had a very interesting situation. I was lecturing at one of our top universities in the country. I actually worked at that university as a as a, a lecturer for a year uh, before I went to the university where I was the professor, University of the Western Cape. And uh, I gave a lecture against the theory of evolution. <laughs> in fact, in one of those lectures, I got spat on. <laughs> so I've been there. I've really been there. And I was speaking about the petrified forests. Mm -hmm. Now, I was explaining that, they, that these forests weren't a model of evolution at all, mm. because the evolutionary theory says, you know, they grew in situ in those places. So these are definitely proof of evolution, because those trees were petrified in their position of growth. Mm -hmm. And uh, this publication proved that they were not, that they were all washed in, that they were evidence of a mm, flood catastrophe. Yeah. And that, of course, freaked the theologists out. So this guy was thumping his desk and shouting at me and screaming. And then eventually he said, this rubbish would never be published in any prestigious journal in the world. Now, there are 400 students sitting there, right, listening to this. And uh, it's interesting, in that, in that lecture, one of the geologists from another university got up and he looked at these guys and he said to him, you know what, this, this evidence is overwhelming. Really, guys, if we want to be true scientists, mm -hmm. We have to take note and rethink our position. Do you think they said sure? <laughs> no. 
<laughs> Definitely. There was a nuclear explosion. <laughs> they nearly got into a fist fight. Yeah. And the students were doing this. <laughs> in the end, I was standing in the front there and watching this altercation taking place. This is science, right? Yeah. And then he shouted at me and he said, this stuff would never get published in a prestigious journal. And I said to him, well, excuse me, what journal would you say is prestigious when it comes to this geological feature, this paleontological information? He said, the Journal of Paleontology, that would be a journal. And I looked at him and I said, it's in there. And he looked at me and he shouted. He said, you liar! Mm. And I said, it'll be on your desk by the morning. So I went home and I looked up <laughs> where it was. I took the publication. I made a copy. I went to his desk. He wasn't there. I put it on his desk. And uh, that evening I had another lecture because these these lectures were arranged after hours, of course, because, you know, it doesn't fit into the university was, curriculum. Yeah. And uh, he looked at me there when I came in, and I said, well, did you find it on your desk? And he says, yes, but it says nothing about the universal flood. So I said, you're absolutely right. It says nothing about the universal flood, because if it would say that, they would never publish it in that journal. Yeah. So it's written in scientific language, just giving the facts and the conclusion without adding any biblical criterion to it. Mm -hmm. And then it's acceptable. And he said, but that's not valid. He says, that's cheating, that's lying. You should have said what your philosophy is. Aha, uh -huh. so if you say the philosophy, then the journal won't take it. Correct. If you just give the facts, the journal might... The, the white coats up there might be confused and take it, right? He's absolutely right. Yeah. I have experienced it in my own life. So to ostracize him for what he says is to deny the truth. Correct. Would you mind, you, you mentioned that you, when you decided, okay, you heard the cock crow, you're going to walk in there, and if I remember correctly, you put down 10 questions. Yes. Would you mind sharing with us maybe one, two or three questions that you put down there for those students? Well, that's quite a tall order. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let, let, I can talk about one or two of them. We're talking about evolution, right? Mm -hmm. And the theory of evolution and how it works. And uh, at that stage... I was lecturing to the medical students and I was uh, teaching them genetics. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> you were actually training medical students? Amongst others, yes. Mm -hmm. I was in the zoology department. I was a comparative physiologist. That was my speciality. That was my research. So I was working on animals. I was working on the endocrine system. Mm -hmm. the hormonal system. Okay. So I compared the hormonal uh, system of viviparity, live bearing, pregnancy, if you like, okay. with uh, of fishes, how they work, reptiles, how they work, mammals, uh -huh. how they work, and uh, I didn't use humans as guinea pigs. <laughs> But uh, I was testing the endocrine system. I'm off the topic now, but yeah. just for interest's mm -hmm. sake, for our our critics who like to say zoologist, you know, mm. uh, I could say I was an endocrinologist. My PhD was largely on uh, endocrinology and electron microscopy and autoradiography, which is biochemistry. Mm. So you know, it it gets very confusing yeah. out there. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, the layman will think he knows how many scales there are on the back of a, of a lizard. But that's not what uh, this is all about. So my research was on all of these animals and I was testing the, the hormonal cascades 
one of the hormones that uh, maintains pregnancy is the hormone progesterone. So um, progesterone is a hormone that uh, is produced by the corpus luteum, which is after the, the ovary has the follicle in the follicular stage where estrogen is in the ascendancy, and then it is transformed after pregnancy, after that uh, ovum is ejected, it is transformed into a corpus luteum, which produces another cascade of, of uh, endocrine products, the most prominent being the progestins. And so I wanted to know, okay, so mammalian systems uh, maintain their pregnancy using progesterone. What, what does a fish do? Mm. You see some fish lay eggs, but yeah. some fish are live-bearing. Yeah. Uh, some fish are oviviparous, some are viviparous. The oviviparous means that they basically have eggs, but they're just retained in the body. And viviparous means that they have to be nurtured in the body, not in the form of an egg, but directly by some form of integration, like a placenta or something similar. So I was working on that, which is a very tricky thing to do. Because if you're working with a mammal, depending on what kind of mammal you're working with, uh, will determine how much blood you can extract without killing the animal, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, if you're working on a mouse or a rat, if you can get a millimeter, milliliter of blood, then you're taking quite a lot compared to the size of the mm. animal. If you're working on a lizard, mm. then you're, you're working in microliters. Right. Yeah. If you're working with a human, you can take a half a liter. Yeah. And uh, you know, if you're working with hormones, that's a very uh, m that's a molecule in very small quantities. So I had to actually adapt the techniques at the stage where where we were working. Many of these techniques were were new, and they all work with radiometrics, so they uh, with uh, radioactive materials so that you can trace how much of a particular hormone there is. And so I had to change the mechanisms and the research abilities to accommodate micro levels of blood in order to determine whether there was anything like it. And you could show then that the cascade in a fish is very similar to that of a mouse. Mm, okay. So that's very interesting, yeah. right? And uh, there are little differences, little nuanced differences. But if you know what the fish works, how he works, and you know how the reptile works, I worked on chameleons, mm -hmm. on the endocrine system of chameleons. That was my master's degree. And uh, then, I, then I transitioned to autoradiography, electron microscopy, and viviparity in fishes, and later I did research on, on rats and hamsters, on rabbits, on vervet monkeys, on you name it, on domestic animals, on pigs, on sheep, you name it, the whole lot. So it gives you a very broad spectrum. But I'm off the topic. What was your question? No. My question was, what, your question was, what did I say? Yeah. All right, so I was teaching genetics. That's how we got into it, right? <laughs> I was teaching genetics to the medical students and uh, I was sitting and thinking about the theory of evolution and genetics. And in genetics, we know that the gene system, your genome, determines your characteristics. Mm. It's your blueprint, right? Yes. And the, the genetic system is extremely complicated because you have structural genes which determine the structure of particular proteins which drive particular uh, reactions in your body and some proteins actually form part of the structure like muscle proteins, etc. And this complexity in the genetic system is absolutely astounding how it works and the integrity thereof. And if you look at the process of um, replication during the meiotic process when cells divide, mm -hmm. then you have to divide the DNA, right? 
It has to be a very precise pro process where you have to make a blueprint. So basically, it's like taking this book, Martin, and saying, okay, the words in this book are written in a particular sequence. And only when they're written in the sequence does it make sense. Yes. Right? So when this is your blueprint in your cell, and you're making a copy of the cell, then you have to copy this blueprint. Mm -hmm. But now if you take the letter here, I'm opening it at random, and it says, And King David said, Call me Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet. Mm. Now, if that were a code, a DNA code, and it worked in triplets, in three determining an amino acid, and I read, And King David said, Call me Zadok the priest. Then I would have to read it as a triplet code, And kin gedav vids aid ko mez ado koth epr is and nat han the prop het and ben etc. You get it? Because I'm reading it, reading it now in threes. threes. Now what if I miss a letter? Uh -huh. Instead of reading and King David call me, I would read hundred kun gudka vz. It would become gibberish. Yeah. All right? So it has to be exact. So you have to make a copy of this, an exact replica. replica. You, you miss one letter. Yeah. It's a total disaster. Mm. And the mechanisms that ensure that it is precise are so complicated. You have an enzyme that runs along the genetic system and reads what I've just read, yeah, yeah. genetically speaking now, and then has to make an exact replica, a copy. Sure. Are you with me? Yeah, yeah. So that's what happens in, in your DNA when you're replicating it. And you have this, this replicase enzyme going <laughs> at tremendous speed because you have thousands of genes. Mm. And let's say Escherichia coli, which is a bacterium in your stomach now, yeah. in your intestine, has to replicate within 20 minutes. Yeah. That means he has to read his book and rewrite it and copy it within 20 minutes without a mistake. Otherwise, the next generation is not going to be E. coli. It's going to be something else, right? Yeah. Yeah. Complicated. Yeah. So when you have that one enzyme running along, you have at least five of them going afterwards behind it, which are called editases. Yeah. Checking that the editing is correct. <laughs> yeah. And if there is a mistake, they retract all the way back and rewrite it yeah. so that the mistake is corrected, okay? So once you start going into the nitty-gritty of how it works, and now we're only talking structural genes. But when you're talking about controlling genes, which make up the, the bulk of your genetic system, that's why it's so ridiculous to give an example like, ooh, the chimpanzee has 98% mm. correlation between their DNA and ours. And that is the most ridiculous statement under the sun because how the genes are controlled is more important about than actually what they say. Yeah. And uh, to put that in, in simple language, let's say the keys on a piano are the genes. Yeah. Right? That's one thing. And I can go plink, 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 plink on the piano. Yeah. That's not music. No. That's plinkety plink. <laughs> All right? Mm -hmm. How do you make music out of that? You have to, know you have to use various combinations. Yeah. All right? And you have to use them with pathos. And you have to use them with intelligence. And you have to use them, you know, in the most amazing fashion. And you sit at those same keys that go all the way up and you go and you make the most amazing music 
That's the controlling genes yeah. deciding what the music's going to be, right? Mm -hmm. So using the same keys, you can get Tchaikovsky and you can get rock and roll, depending on what you want to play, right? Exactly. So the genetic system is so complicated that these white coats haven't got the foggiest idea of what they're playing, talking about. It's like, really, I'm being a little bit facetious now. But if you have discovered, Martin, by looking at the piano, that the keys are in a particular order, have you got the foggiest idea about music at that stage? No. No. This is what we're at. Correct. All right? Mm -hmm. So now, we've discovered what the sequence of the DNA is. That's like someone saying, I know in which order the keys on the piano are. <laughs> yeah. And you haven't got the foggiest idea how to play the thing. Correct. Right? Mm -hmm. That's science. Now we're talking science. Now I'm talking like that guy, and I'll probably <laughs> <laughs> be <laughs> written off and thrown to, the, thrown to the dogs. Okay. So, complicated. The next question, which begs to be answered, is how did it come into existence? Mm. Right? Correct. This complex system that has to work like clockwork, mm -hmm. that has so many complicated mechanisms to ensure perfect replication. And the evolutionary paradigm says that natural selection mm. doesn't work at the level of the genotype it only works at the level of the phenotype. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Now, the phenotype is what you look like. Mm -hmm. All right? So if I had to describe you, uh, let's not do that. Because <laughs> I will be naughty. <laughs> but let's just say you're shorter than me. Yeah. <laughs> Correct? Yes. That doesn't necessarily mean that I run faster, but the probability that I, with longer legs, could, could have run faster if I were your age, yeah. pretty high, right? Yeah. Okay. So natural selection works what is there. Mm. Natural selection doesn't know what's written in this book. No. You only know what's written in this book once you see it. There you are. Mm. So that we call your phenotype. Natural selection works on the level of the phenotype. It doesn't work on the level of the actual information. So how did the information come into existence? By chance. Yeah. By chance. Mm. So you mean to tell me, Martin, that this book with all its information fell out of the sky one day and it was complete and made sense? It couldn't be modified by the evolutionary process because natural selection doesn't work at the level of the genotype. It only works at the level of the phenotype. Let me explain that differently. If I want to know which aeroplane flies best mm. of two different models, what do I have to do? Compare the two and... Go and fly them. Yeah, fly them. And see which one works, right? Normally you use something called a test pilot. And he gets paid an exorbitant amount of money because he doesn't know whether he's going to get out of that box alive, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So if I want to know which plane flies best, I have to go and test them. Correct. Does it answer the question, where did the planes come from? No. Okay. Where did the planes come from? From the factory. From the factory. Okay. Who built the airplane? The Some machine. bozo, right? Yeah. Some bozo. Uh, okay, the fact that you built it still means nothing. Who designed it? Yeah, the designer. It takes an in a designer, engineer. an engineer, right? So there's a heck of a process. Now, when that engineer went and designed it, did he make the drawings? And did he work out the aerodynamics? Did he use the mathematics associated with it? Did he use lift and force and this mm -hmm. and that and all that information? Yes. Okay. And then he wrote it in the book. Mm. And he said, here's the procedure of how to build this airplane. Okay? Yeah. Now, if I give you the book with the procedure how to build the airplane, mm -hmm. you and I have the book. 
fly the airplane? <laughs> yeah, no, you have to get into it and fly it. Can you fly the book? No. 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 What must you do with the book? Build the fl airplane. Okay, Use so this to build the airplane. So you, what do you need? You need an the interpreter of what it says. Yes. You need an interpreter. And you need the mechanism to build the airplane. Correct. Okay, so the book had to come about by chance in evolution mm -hmm. because there's no designer. Right? Came about by chance with the blueprint. Yeah. Plus the mechanism to transfer the blueprint into the product. And until you get the product, natural selection doesn't work. So, given the complexity of the situation, what is the probability, Martin, that this book, without a designer, fell from the sky one day with its blueprint? Mm. What's the probability? Zero. Okay. <laughs> it's zero. All right, now even if it fell from the sky and dead lies, what's the probability that the mechanism to read what it says and to transfer the information into an actual product, meaning that you must get the raw materials, mm -hmm. that you must get the sequence and to produce the raw materials, plus you must bend the raw materials into the shape that they have to be, so that they have eyes and a nose and teeth and everything that is in you, which is incredibly complicated. Even you take a simple cell. Yeah. Where did that come from? Also by chance. By chance. <laughs> so I asked my students and my audience, what is the probability of that happening? And how much faith do you need? Mm. How much faith do you need to believe it? And that caused mayhem. I can imagine. That was one of the questions. <laughs> that was one of the questions. Yeah. It caused mayhem. Wow. To the extent that one of the students got up, a young lady, she was doing her honors degree, BSc, Bachelor of Science Honors, and she looked around the hall and she said, when I came to this university, I was a believing Christian. And now that I'm an honest student and I've been through the Bachelor of Science degree and I'm now studying Bachelor of Science honors degree, I've become an atheist. And now... I am told that you lied to me. Do you think that went down well? <laughs> no. Eh? Mm -mm. No, it didn't go down well. Didn't go down well for my career either. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yes. But that's how it is. And that's, I'm sure it's not only in the evolutionary science department. When, after leaving the university, after this debacle, you know what the debacle was, Martin? A conflict between truth and error. Yes. That's what the debacle was. And when I left the university because of the debacle of truth and error, I believe that God, in his mercy, reinstated me back in the university and I became the professor and head of a department of zoology. Mm-hmm as a comparative physiologist within that department. And I became the head of that department, which is a miracle, being a creationist, right? Yeah. And I received, in the end, that grant from the Royal Society for reconstruction and development and uh, a, a massive research program that, as I said, resulted in postdoc Harvard students, right? Yes, yes. So, uh, so God had a plan. God had a plan, correct. And when I started the research mm. on nutrition, correct. Do you think that it was plain sailing, or do you think that the same opposition that I received on the level of evolution, that I received the same opposition on the basis of nutrition? Definitely. So, Martin. My question to you is this. Is the world being fed a bunch of lies when it comes to nutrition? 
if they were fed a bunch of lies on the evolutionary track, I'm sure because probably in nutrition, they also use evolutionary theories. Okay, now our illustrious scientists, scientists basically alluded to the fact that you can follow the money trail, mm. right? Yes. And the PCR tests, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a polymerase test that enhances whatever is there. Yeah. So it takes something small and it makes it big. And many of these tests cannot be used what they are being used for. That's why they give false positives or false negatives. He actually said at one stage that you can test for AIDS and it will give you a positive test and you can test again tomorrow and it might give you a negative test. Mm -hmm. Because they're using some of the tests that are developed for the various diseases in, in a way that it shouldn't be used. But for every test, there's a money trail. Yes. And for every positive test, there's a super money trail. Mm. Because thousands of dollars get funneled into these organizations for the governments that run on positive tests. That's it. So if you can make a test mandatory and force 7 billion people to take a test, and you put that into dollar terms. There are the people that have the patents that get a cut. Mm. There are a people that the people that prescribe the test that get a cut. There are the people that produce Used. the test mm. that get a cut. There are the people that oversee, like the the CDC, etc. Mm. They get a cut. And the scientists that are involved, they get the huge salaries as a consequence of that cut. Can you see this? This can be a very useful thing. Correct. And the more positives you have, the better for the money trail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can definitely see it. Did he say that some of the medication can certainly kill you? Yes. All right. Now, I'm a scientist, Martin. And I can understand that sometimes a medication that can kill you might be useful if it also kills the disease before it kills you. Yes. And he said something similar, mm -hmm. right? Like chemotherapy, Maybe. for example. Mm. It's definitely bad for you. Yes. And if you take it for a long time, it'll kill you. Yes. But the hope is, as he said, that it'll kill the bad guy in you before it kills the good guy in you. Yes. So the bad cell, the cancer cell, dies before you and then you, you get over it, right? Now we know today that a large proportion of cancer is based on lifestyle diseases. Yes. The statistics tell you that. That's it. So a correction of lifestyle would be a better alternative than the other, right? But there are also genetic implications, and the young child can get it. And life is, is not fair. Mm. And uh, some people have a weak constitution, some have a stronger constitution, some are more predisposed genetically than others. There are many, many factors. Mm -hmm. I'm not against using a medication that will kill a disease, even though it's bad for you, if the natural alternative will take longer than the disease takes to kill you. Mm. In other words, if the disease is going to kill you in seven days and a natural cure will help you in 10 days that's too late mm -hmm. but if a product will kill the disease in two days even though it's bad for you it can save your life so yeah. i'm not anti-science but many many drugs no matter what they are will do something to you which is detrimental yes it might save your life for mm -hmm. a while, mm -hmm. but it'll come out in another way. That's so it. here is a quote that I would like to read. It comes from the Spirit of Prophecy, How to Live. Drugs never cure disease. They only change its form and location. When drugs are introduced into the system, for a time they seem to have a beneficial effect. A change might take place, but the disease is not cured. It will manifest itself in some other form. 
The disease which the drug was given to cure may disappear, but only to reappear in a new form, such as a skin disease, ulcers, painful disease, joints, and sometimes in a more dangerous and deadly form. Nature keeps struggling and the patient suffers with different ailments until there is a sudden breaking down of her efforts and death follows. Many kind times, Martin. Well, all the time. Mm. If you take the little pamphlet out <laughs> from <laughs> the little drug that yes. you have just received from the pharmacy, the list of side effects is so long and so daunting that you dare not read it because you will not swallow that stuff if you read it, right? Yeah, it's happened to me quite often or quite a few times. Okay. So once you start understanding this principle, avoidance mm. and treatment of the cause by correcting whatever it is that your body requires, it manifests itself in the form of a disease is a better option to go. Correct. Sometimes, sometimes, as I said, it can happen that the nature of the disease requires another intervention. I'm not against that. But the logical thing to do is to try and do the best you can to give yourself the best environment to be healthy in. The best medicine is good food. Correct. And that is the best medicine. And it's important. We will, in a future discussion, talk about that because there's a big war going on on what is good food. Exactly. So we need to talk about that issue. So for our viewers, we're not against science. No. But we are against science falsely so-called. Correct. I have a serious problem with many of the philosophies of science. And I have a very serious problem with the we mm. of science. So may God give us the wisdom. And uh, this was basically an introduction into our discussion on health. It seems to work out this way. <laughs> our introductions <laughs> turn out to be <laughs> lectures. We must stop this nonsense. <laughs> but... It is just a fact that this is how it works. If we start understanding the issue, yeah. then maybe we can make informed choices. Oh, definitely. And, and then maybe the position that we stand for will not look so ridiculous. I hope so. Let's pray. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have penned in a book where we come from, and that you have penned in a book where we are going. And that you have given us a road map of how to get there. But we have a stubborn nature and tend to want to find our own path. And it takes pain and suffering sometimes to bring us to our senses. I believe that that which can happen on the individual level is happening on a universal scale and the whole of humanity will have to decide between the veracity of two religious systems wearing white coats. Help us to make good decisions. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.